and Hoople's cap. In today's video, I'm going to demystify the whole idea of using iodine to protect your thyroid gland in case of a nuclear accident or nuclear war. I'm over 40, I know I don't look it. Perhaps you're over 40 and you might follow the guidelines of the Americans and not give yourself potassium iodine or potassium iodate if you're exposed to a radiation event. So you can see the CDC recommends people over the age of 40, unless they happen to be pregnant or breastfeeding, shouldn't take potassium iodate or potassium iodide in the event of nuclear exposure. The CDC also tells you only to take it if you're told to by a doctor. Let's have a look at this. 102 years after Spanish influenza, we actually had a pandemic. And it wasn't a very killing pandemic, but it killed significantly. Initially, in April of 2020, the World Health Organization told you that you didn't need to wear a mask, told you that you didn't need to wear a mask in public, and told healthcare workers they only needed surgical masks. At the time, I was the night administrator of a major teaching hospital in Canada, and I knew that the World Health Organization was full of garbage. The reason they said that was because there was not enough masks for healthcare professionals. The general public, if they'd been in N95s right from the beginning, would have blunted, hugely blunted, the pandemic. It's airborne. It spreads by people breathing out and people breathing in. We're in exactly the same situation with potassium iodide. There's not enough of it. People are panicking. People are stockpiling it. Probably too much. I'm not a pharmacist or a doctor. I am a registered nurse. I'm telling you, if you're over the age of 40, but under the age of 70, and it's a nuclear war scenario, you need it. If you don't have much of it, and it's a choice between you at the age of 70 taking it and giving it to your six-year-old nephew, give all of it, the full dose to your six-year-old nephew, even if you end up having no dose. I'm 58, I would consider it to be really sad news if I survive a nuclear war and five to 10 years later I get metastatic thyroid cancer and die. You don't have enough. You need to give it to the fetus via the mother who's pregnant. It can cause birth defects, be aware of that. They don't really tell you that, but it can. But almost every fetus that's exposed to radioactive iodine is gonna get thyroid cancer and die very early on. So that's why. In terms of who should get it, I think over the age of 70 in a nuclear war situation, you shouldn't really bother. I do think if it's a localised radiation issue from, say, Three Mile Island or a nuclear plant, and you're over the age of 70, why not? Take it. There should be well enough in the local area and be brought into the local area for everybody. If you've got a fetus on board and you're pregnant, congratulations. If it's a nuclear war scenario, you're probably going to regret your choices on conception at this point. But before you do, take that potassium iodide because your fetus is in really 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 urgent need of getting it absolutely this is how it breaks down if you have to ration it fetus newborn under the age of one month one month to three years old three years old to 12 12 to 18 18 to 40 you can say 30 or 35 they're the age groups that are most critically going to get thyroid cancer if they don't get a blocker all potassium iodide is is a blocker of the thyroid. I didn't mention breastfeeding, did I? I have no idea why they tell breastfeeding women to take it. Other than for the woman herself, the fetus will absorb radioactive I-131 from the mom. Baby who's breastfeeding will not. It's excreted via urine, not by breast milk. Now there might be some trace elements in the breast milk, and in fact, it's not gonna do anything to protect the baby, only the mom. This is dosing charts, this is what you need to do. I will talk about dosing as one of the myths because you can get away with using less than recommended. Myth number one, potassium iodide or iodate if you're in Europe is only actually useful if you're under the age of 40. That is not true. Myth number two, you can take tincture of black walnut and spare yourself the expense of buying potassium iodide or potassium iodate. Potassium iodide liberates about 100 milligrams of free iodine into the human body and allows the thyroid gland to completely absorb non-radioactive iodine. One tablet of potassium iodide will actually cause over 700 times the amount of iodine to be in the body that your little thyroid gland can absorb. It completely swamps it with non-radioactive iodine, so if you ingest I131, none of that will lodge in the thyroid. What about black walnut tincture? Black walnuts, I don't know how, why, but they either create or what they, they create or you know, like hold a uh, concentrate iodine. Yeah. Black walnuts themselves, when you squeeze them, uh, iodine comes out. It smells like iodine, looks like iodine. It'll burn their skin right off your arm. I did it one time, believe me. 
because it's an oxidizer, it burns. Black walnuts are actually mostly specific to North America and they're only available at certain times of year. And it sounds kind of good, doesn't it? There's lots of videos out there and articles even telling you that if you get black walnut tincture and use that in a radiation event or a nuclear war, you are doing the same job as if you're taking Ki, potassium iodide, or potassium iodate. Whoa, hoopals, come on, there must be some truth to this, right? No, there's no truth to it at all. It's utter rubbish, utter trash to suggest this is a healthy alternative or would even work. At maximum, the black walnut husk has 15 parts per million of iodine in it. If you distill black walnut husks and make gallons and gallons and gallons of it, by the way, it is toxic, and attempt to drink it, you will die long before you even partially block your thyroid with iodine. And I would like to thank Martha from Old School Prepping for actually bringing this to my attention. I don't know why, but I've actually managed to avoid seeing any of these videos about using black walnut in a nuclear event. So myth two, you can use black walnut? Absolutely not, absolutely not. Potassium iodide is better than potassium iodate. Potassium iodate is better than potassium iodide. The three is a toother. Which of those do you expect is true? Pepper Potpourri in 2018 did an absolutely great video on this and I'm going to clip it and I'm also going to link it. You should watch it. It absolutely explains the difference between the two and it saved me a whole bunch of research. Thanks Pepper Potpourri. So which is better, potassium iodate or potassium iodide for protection from radioactive iodine? I am not a pharmacist, nor am I a medical expert. So as always, always do your own research. Just don't believe a YouTube expert. Here in the US, the military and the companies that own uh, nuclear reactors all stock up on potassium iodide pills. And potassium iodide is FDA approved. Potassium iodate is not FDA approved for this use. It is approved for using uh, in bread as a, uh, I guess a kind of preservative or something, I'm not quite sure, but it is not approved for this use. I found out that some European countries such as United Kingdom and the Netherlands, they exclusively use potassium iodate. So if you look at just pure cost, potassium iodate is definitely the winner. You can buy 60, 170 milligram tablets at Camping Survival for only $14.95. The prices in 2022 are hugely higher than they were in 2018. That would give four persons a two week supply. So it's a great value for a family. Now on the other hand, the same company handles Iostat, which is potassium iodide tablets, and these tablets are $11.95 for 14. So they will only cover dosage for one person for two weeks. Is potassium iodide better than potassium iodide? I mean, which is more effective? You know, that was a lot harder to find in my research. This quote is from the World Health Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency. Stable iodine can be used as either potassium iodide or potassium iodate. Potassium iodide is the preferred alternative since potassium iodate has the disadvantage of being a stronger intestinal irritant. Potassium iodide is the preferred thyroid blocker for personnel handling radioiodine and is recommended as a prophylaxis for the population in the near field of a nuclear reactor, which would be likely to be exposed to radioiodine in an accidental breach of, or of containment. However, in hot and humid climates, this hygroscopic chemical has a poor shelf life on the other hand, another iodine-rich salt, potassium iodate, is quite stable and has a much longer shelf life. The results suggest that potassium iodide is as, as effective a thyroid blocking agent as potassium iodide. Both of them are effective. Now I did go beyond her video and to verify it because that's what you need to do and she was bang on right in what she said. But all you need to know about this is iodate and iodide work exactly the same. They are chemical compounds, they are constructed differently. To write the formula for potassium iodide, we go to the periodic table and we see potassium, that's K, that's a metal, and iodine, that's I, that's a nonmetal. 
iodate is always going to be cheaper, or it should be cheaper than potassium iodide. Now in a nuclear war situation, you want to get iodide if you've got a choice, if you can. The reason being is iodate can be much more harsh on your stomach. Potassium iodate, potassium iodide, the difference, what's the difference between them? Well, generally all you have to really worry about is if you have a little bit of a reaction to potassium iodate, you might want to, or I'm sorry, potassium iodide, it's a little more upsetting to the stomach than potassium iodate. Potassium iodate is what we offer at thepepperstop.com. You're going to have to take potassium iodide or iodate for quite some time if there's been a nuclear war. Other than its cost, iodate is worse than iodide because it can be harsher on the stomach. Myth number three, iodate versus iodide. Realistically, there's no difference. Get one or get both. Myth number four, potassium iodate or iodide is absolutely safe for human consumption and you can take it and not worry about it. Three main categories of people shouldn't actually be taking that and you can look at the slide for that. There's also a bunch of contraindications for other types of people. You'll find in the description a link to actual information where you can actually look up your own medication and see if there's a major or minor issue if you take it with potassium iodide. I'm guessing it's the same issue if you take iodate, but that's a guess. Drooling when you take potassium iodide is extremely common. Be aware of that. In of itself, it's something to keep an eye on. The three types of person who shouldn't take it in the slide is real. Don't use it. If you have any sort of heart disease or kidney disease or are medications related to those, you want to take potassium iodide with caution. You might want to use a lower dose, you might want to use it less often, you might want to skip a few days. You want to really, really monitor your heart and your urine production because one of the major side effects is potassium is liberated and not excreted. Potassium very quickly, if it's too high or too low, and it doesn't take much, will kill you. Potassium iodide and potassium iodate are both excreted in the kidney. So if you don't have proper kidney function, they're retained. The iodine can be a bit of a problem, the potassium will end you. When you've successfully taken it, you actually block the uptake of the radioactive iodine 131 in the body. You've ingested it by various methods, and we'll get into that. And now it can't be stored in the thyroid where it really wants to be. So within about 24 hours, you flush it out of your kidneys. Your urine's radioactive. So I'm on a med for blood pressure, so I looked it up and this is what I found out. I have to be very cautious if I take that and take potassium iodide or iodate. I'm on herbostatin for hypertension. In a nuclear war, I become my own doctor. In the here and now, and in the event of a localized emergency, I'm not your doctor, you're not your doctor, talk to a doctor. This recommendation that I'm gonna make is for me, not for you. When I look at the information and it's pretty detailed and I think about it and I know my biochemistry because I'm a registered nurse and I look at it, blah, blah, blah. One of the things that strikes me is I wanna make sure I'm well hydrated and stay hydrated. I also figure I wanna take less of the tablet than I normally would if I was healthy and take it for not as long and take space between it. In other words, I want to try and limit the actual accumulation of potassium in my body. I'm also going to look out for the side effects of high potassium. Again, I can monitor my pulse quite successfully. I am trained for that. I know how to do it. You might not be, but you might want to start doing that now if you're on these medications and you plan to take potassium iodide. So for me specifically, I would take at least four to five liters of fresh water a day whilst I was on potassium iodide. I wouldn't take Advil. I would pro for now anyway, especially because it's not really that great, it seems, if you're over the age of 40. Not conclusive, but why not take paracetamol, Tylenol instead? One of the things Kitty said, and she's right on this, so I want to have a two-pronged approach to this. So I know if I'm going to be exposed to iodine-131, I'm going to take potassium iodide. One of the things I would do is I would take the loading dose. I wouldn't necessarily take 130 milligrams for the next 10 days or 14 days or how long I feel I need to take it for. I would probably skip or take half doses from that point. And I may do a loading dose every four to five days, i.e. go back to 130. One of the things I would also do is I would also skip part of my blood pressure medication. I do that now. I'm almost off it. So I'm actually going to look at that very carefully. It's not foolproof. None of this stuff will be foolproof. There's no, yes, this is the answer to your specific question. I'm 100% right. I can't diagnose you or treat you over the internet, nor do I particularly want to. You need to be able to be self-sufficient enough to be able to do stuff significantly well on your own in the event of civilization collapse. If you're watching videos on using black walnut tincture now and thinking they're reasonable, you're in a really bad place if things go south. You might be familiar with this. It expired in June. I'm not bothered by that. Or you might have something similar to this. Or you might have a little plastic bottle with iodate in it. This one expires in 2027. I'm not bothered about it. When it's iodate or iodide, they'll actually last forever. 
pretty much. Eventually they'll crumble into a powder and you won't be able to use them. But if you keep them dry and in the dark and make sure that the temperature isn't too extreme up and down, though they can do quite well, you can take these tablets long past their expiry providing they're intact. You might lose some of the efficiency, but bear in mind each tablet, 130 milligram for iodide, is actually 700 times the amount of iodine you need in your body to completely block your thyroid gland. It's overkill and that's why it's overkill. Any iodine 131 will really like to get into your thyroid and any amount of it can cause thyroid cancer. And the younger you are, the more likely it is to cause the cancer. Now back in the 80s, a Lugol's iodine, a Lugol's iodine, whatever it was called, was quite common. It's a liquid version of this. And it's actually kind of useful for babies and stuff because you use an eyedropper and stuff like that. Just shove it in the back of the mouth, shove the mouth and rub them until they swallow it. Nice, but there you go, that's how you treat kids. However, if you do have the liquid version, if it separates out, shake it up and use it. However, if it goes yellow or brown, probably shouldn't be using it. Congratulations, you got to the end of the first video on potassium iodate and potassium iodide. I hope you watched the whole thing. If you have any observations or comments or disagreements, please put them in the comments. Let's start a dialogue. Please feel free to share widely or clip it or use this in any way you wish. I actually want the information out there rather than get new viewers. I hope you have a great day. I hope you have a great week. The next video in this series will cover the following topics. Should you get liquid, tablets or capsules? Can you use this on your pets? And if so, how? This is a critical one and it's interpretation by me. For how long do you take this in the event of a nuclear war? Will taking this stop me getting cancer? Will taking this stop me getting radiation sickness? Oh, I forgot. Can you use iodized salt and or seaweed kelp as a substitute? And the big one is when do you take it? What I originally said for potassium iodide is written on there for kitty in case I didn't make it. It's wrong. But you need to be taking this zero to 24 hours before exposure to radioactive iodine. Anyway, I would like to finish off with a quote from Pepe Potpourri. And if you do watch this, I'd really love to know if you still stand by this. This was 2018. It is very, very unlikely that you or anyone in your family will ever have to take these pills. Doodles! This has been a dog poisoned by potassium iodide production 2022.